Yeah. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Derde Show. A place to sit back, relax and have a good conversation. Today I am with the one and only Tamara Gabazard. If you've lived in Kuwait for two, three years and don't know Tamara, <laughs> that's your problem. Tamara's all over the place. She's into fitness, animals, and she's an enthusiast in everything she does. Welcome to the Derde Show. A place to sit back, relax and enjoy a good conversation. I'm Tamara. I'm... I haven't actually thought of a way to define myself, but I guess I'm a veterinarian. Mm-hmm. I work at the Kuwait Zoo and um, I dabble in a lot of different types of movements, basically. So dance, aerial, Pilates, yoga, anything that I can do to get you to move a little bit. Something that's not like like the normal walking forward pattern that we have. Like People don't realize that you've got like a lateral aspect of your body where you can move to the side. Um, I guarantee you if you try it's a bit difficult <laughs> interesting yeah. moving yeah. to the side like just like a co- do you know what a Cossack squat is when you're standing upright and then you just yeah, squat yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for some people having that that stability fire is actually really difficult so and uh, does it have a lot to do with the anatom- ana- anatomy of the body no I think it's just our lifestyles lifestyles yeah we're always sitting what we do is we sit we stand we walk forward yeah unless you're playing soccer then I guess you can run backwards or something or that's true that's true and when did you get into this um movement yeah. I get uh well I grew up as a ballet dancer really yeah so I did ballet um here in Kuwait Kuwait School of Dance and then uh I was a swimmer I um rode horses most of my life competitively really yeah where did you ride jumper. I was at quite riding center oh nice yeah the nice. only reason I don't ride now is because I walk into the stable and everyone's like oh my god something's <laughs> wrong with my horse so <laughs> I, can, I can never really like you know just you, your job kind of takes over yeah uh, yeah but it's, do they ask you for free checkups and stuff Ed? can you please just walk around and check <clears> my horse it's It's not just them that ask me for free checkups, it's everybody. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's okay though. It happens. Um, but yeah, it's not, you know, everyone's like, you know, can you just check this? And then like, if it, I'll check it. But like, if it's going to be a, a workup, then, you know. Yeah. It would I'm curious nice. though. I mean, since you know so much about animals, I mean, I've heard you on the radio a bunch of times. <laughs> and is it hard being able to just enjoy riding horses when yep. without? It's hard. Yeah? yeah. I actually haven't ridden a horse since I graduated vet school. Which was? Uh, 2016, September. Two years ago, right now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, it kind of actually, uh, uh, it, like, I hate saying this, but it's kind of true. Like, you love animals so much, but when you see it, you start seeing the job in you. So, like, if I go to a horseback riding competition and I'm watching a horse jump, I find all the lamenesses just by watching. I'll see something wrong. I'll see the way that horse is carrying himself. Like, I'm like, okay, his back hurts. Okay, his neck is tight. This shoulder is tight. So it, it stops being enjoyable. It's just me staring at an animal and working. And wow. Yeah. And like one of the internal medicine specialists for uh, dogs and cats that I worked at in Davis, um, I did my last, like my Maidani work, I guess like my clinical work at UC Davis. And she's a horse girl. And she's like, oh yeah, I don't. I specialize in small animals so that when I would go to ride horses, like it never felt like a job. Because people would be like, hey, can you take a check? No, no, no. I'm only internal medicine for small animal. You know? Nice. Yeah, you have yeah, an yeah, excuse yeah. to say no. Huh? So yeah, so she told me. I was like, damn, I didn't think about this. <laughs> <laughs> and you do general. like you I do everything. Everything. Yeah. yeah. And what made you start? What made you get and decide to be a veterinarian? Um, I don't really have a beginning. I think it was just always there. Like... The love for animals. Of yeah, curiosity. it's. I've always been more connected with them than people, and I've always, I've always, actually, I told my mother, I think when I was like five or six, I said I wanted to be a zookeeper until I figured out what animal doctor was, you know, like really? vet. <laughs> yeah, because like I was like, oh, a zookeeper, and then uh, she's like, yeah, like pretty fast it changed. She's like, and then she, she said I started saying animal doctor, and then I learned veterinarian. So, no way. Yeah, since then, since I was like six, wow. seven. Wow, and now you work at the zoo. Yeah, one of the places, for sure. One of the places? Yeah, I work out in a lot of places. What else do you do? Uh, I like work she's one of the only people that when you text, she's like, I'm kind of busy with a lion that morning. Can we do it in the afternoon? Oh, like, yeah, that was, a, yeah, that was when I went out for the tigers. She literally, she wasn't she yeah. was serious. She wasn't joking. It was like, all right, do your lion thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I work at the Scientific Center. Um, I do both terrestrial and marine. What do you I, mean well, you do marine? Marine uh, aquatics. So sharks, rays, re- eels, fish. I'm learning more about that, which is actually really cool. 
Um, I work with the Sea Turtle Rescue in Kuwait, which is, uh, I'm, I'm their veterinarian. It's, it's part of the fisheries department in Amghara under PAF, mm-hmm. um, which is like Hayat mm-hmm. Um I work with a marine biologist named Hussein al and the man is a genius. He What's his is, name? Let's get him on dead. Yeah, you should get him on here. He used to work. <laughs> oh my God, the man was like on admissions of University of Miami. Like he used to work. Uh, oh, I think it was like South Carolina or North Carolina Aquarium, like NASA at some point. He what? cited 111 times like his research. The man is a genius. He's a gem in Kuwait. He's a gem. Why is he hiding? Does He's not the government not that. that's hiding him. Anyway, <laughs> 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 the government hides all the gems. Oh, that's uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> you're like, I have to add it. <laughs> that is perfect. Yeah. Why do you do that government? <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, so yeah. So I work with him and another marine biologist uh, mm-hmm. named Abdullah Said Omar. Um, and usually around this time of year, we get a cold front that comes in and it really messes up the water temperature, so it drops too fast, and they can't acclimate, so they end up floating, and then it, they get like since they can't sink and they can't dive, they get emaciated. Um, they get full filled with like barnacles all over them. Uh, they can get pneumonia. Yeah, so I work with them. Um, Wait, how does the water temperature change based on the be, weather? Um, that's a question for Hussein. <laughs> that's like all the marine, like, so actually that's funny because him and I are writing a paper right now and we're actually giving a talk at Abdullah Salam Cultural Center on the 13th of March about oh, the nice. research that we're doing with sea turtles. And uh, I asked them, I was like, you know, usually uh, when you're looking at to raise the, the temperature of water, it takes a lot of energy. But I was like, I don't understand, like, how does it drop so fast here? And he's like, and he was starting to go into it. But there's a reason I didn't go into marine biology. And it's not because of the animals. It's because you have to learn about like oceanic and atmospheric pressures and water temperature stuff. And I'm like, I kind of like blanked for a bit. Yeah, I need to like sit with him and understand and not do it on WhatsApp. Uh, but you should ask him that question for sure. At least you know what you're into and what you're not into. You know, at least yeah, as yeah. soon as you be like, <laughs> okay, I'm good. Let me yeah. go somewhere else. You yeah, know? like I don't do vaccinations, not because I don't believe in them, but just because I, like, people will be like, can you vac- vaccinate my cat? I'm like, no. There's like enough places here that will vaccinate your cat. Do you have an emergency? Come to me. I do not want to vaccinate your cat. So, so I love that. Do you have an emergency? Come to me. So I, I want to hear a couple of emergencies. Come on, I come for help. Uh, well, I had one last night. So I've had a few here, but I had like one of my favorite ones. Well, well uh, one of my favorite ones in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, one of my favorite ones in the U.S. was uh, I was standing. I was on like horse ICU uh, rotation, and there was nothing coming in, and so we were just kind of like going on to some of the other places. So I was with the sports medicine people, and they were looking at a horse, and they were taking bone uh, a bone marrow aspirate out of the sternum of a horse, and uh, they centri- they centrifuge it and they process it in a lab, and they re- and they inject it into tendons or ligaments or um, mostly tendons and ligaments for that um, to restart growth in those areas like if there's a tear if there's like especially a tear that you can't get to and you can't heal and it just keeps tearing and the horse had a massive reaction and this was like a huge show jumping like dutch warm blood horse and it starts shaking and the thing dropped like the thing just collapsed in the stocks and I was maybe the most happy like most happy person in that moment I was like it's mine like I just took that case I was wow. like yeah it was really cool and I have the leukocyte uh, sorry the blood count um, is actually the background of my iPad because if you're looking at neutrophils which are the white blood cells in your body when there's a problem what happens is they can they drop so it's something called a neutropenia or you have a neutrophilia depending on like what's happening in the body this is based with humans but yeah, yeah 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 all like body processes kind of do this and um they all went to that area which was in the tendon so outside of the blood so the number of the neutrophils in the horse's bloodstream is usually between nine thousand and thirteen thousand, and it was 54. Wow! Because all of them just left. They left the body and went to that tendon. Yeah, it was oh so cool. Oh my god, that was like five X. Yeah. Wait, 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 what do you say? What do you say? It's like so cool. It's what does so that mean? cool. Does, like the body does it scratch an itch. No, like, like, oh. I don't know. You know, the body just uh, the way it heals itself and the way oh. it functions and the way it protects and you know when you think about it in yeah. that sense, then an animal's coming in for an emergency. Like yesterday, I had a woman that called me. Um, her cat was like not moving she's like the stomach's really hard and i was like okay i know exactly what's happening i'm like hey is, is it peeing at all and she's like not really i was like okay it's a, your cat's blocked um 
cats are really sensitive animals. If you have like construction happening next door, they uh, their bladder ends up, like so they end up getting really stressed and they get inflammation in their bladder and then they like start having these mucus plugs that will like block the urethra and then they can't pee. And if you can't pee, your urine is basically like your urine is acting to expel toxins, medications, fluid out of your oh body, God. right? So it's acting in homeostasis. And so what's happening is this 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 organ is now unable to expel everything, so it's getting backed up and get kind of things are backing up in the blood. And one of the things that backs up and is unable to be released is potassium. And if you have too high of a potassium count in your blood, in your bloodstream, then your heart can stop. So it's like this sequela of things. And I was like, you know what? Bring them over. Uh, I wasn't really, I don't have all the unblocking tools. So you take this catheter and you kind of shove it through the urethra, but they need to be like on a few drugs to do yeah, that. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Um, so what I did was I call it a poor man's unblocking. It's something I learned in, in a shelter in the US. And mm-hmm. what they do is they basically do a decompressive cysto. So they put in a needle and they pull out the fluid in the bladder uh, until it's like somewhat small. And uh, What's I give a it. severe condition. Uh, yeah, huh? it's painful. It's really painful. Imagine you can't pee for like two or three days. That wow. pain that you feel. And c- cats go through that? Too? Yeah. Is and it so common? it's very common in male cats. Actually. Well, thanks for the heads up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about things to lessen that. But yeah, um, but yeah, it does happen. And mm. it, you just kind of have to increase their water intake. Sometimes you have to change the food, especially if there's crystals, like on a urinary diet. Um, and, it, you know, obese cats are prone to it more than... <clears throat> <laughs> not, ob- not obese cats. <laughs> He's cute though. <laughs> He's cute. It's okay, my cat. My cat's chunky too. <laughs> it's yeah. tricky though. I mean, uh, when it comes to being obese, because I feed him the same, and he's not the dominant one when it comes to like um, eating first. But um, I don't know. Do you think that we should reduce his weight? Um, he's okay, honestly. I think he's just kind of a bigger cat. Like he's not too fat. But if you get one of those laser things, they tend to move more. Laser thing. Yeah, like a laser pointer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just trip them out. Put them on some catnip and go. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. <laughs> I remember our cat found the catnip. Yeah? Found the entire bag. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah, man. <laughs> we woke up the next day and he was just on his back. Yeah, yeah. Aish Hayatik, man. Does it really like, get them? It gets them high. Like high, high. Like happy high. Happy yeah, high. Yeah, it's nice. Do, uh, yeah, like... Uh, in the U.S., because when I was living in California, we had the forest fires, and a lot of, and I was in Northern California, so it was near Grass Valley, which is where all the weed is grown. So we'd get all these burn victims that came in, but they were all like really high, but also um, THC is an intoxicant to animals and can cause liver failure if ingested. Um, so they came in like pretty high, but also sedated but also maybe on the border of toxicity but also burnt so it was like a very like weird way of managing these animals wow. oh i thought you were talking about the people at first <laughs> oh my god uh, actually i'm pretty sure they were all high too so <laughs> wow. all right damn i didn't know that yeah and w- w- okay so let's talk about some of the um yeah common symptoms that okay. cats usually so we call them signs, to. clinical signs, not mm-hmm. symptoms, because a mm-hmm. symptom is something you can communicate. Uh, a that? sign is something that I can see. Like a symptom is oh, something you tell me. Okay, right? okay. So animals can't talk. So mm-hmm. we, it's a clinical sign. Um, in terms of what disease? The blocking, cat blocking, or in what? In general, I mean, if somebody has a cat, a cat, most of the people here in Kuwait have cats and yeah. dogs, right? Yeah. So what are some things people should look out to? Yeah, um, look out always for? if they're, like, you know you're a cat better than anyone. Mm-hmm. If it's acting weird, like if it's acting off for a few days. Yeah. And, you know, people say this all, they're like, I don't know, but it's just something's not right, you know? Uh, and it's like, okay. And usually that's the biggest key that you have. Sometimes there's like a, okay, something is changing down the road. Like I told you, some cats can react to having construction. But a lot of the times you should trust your gut intuition. Going off food, that's a weird one. Yeah. Cats hiding, that's also, if they're hiding, but they're not usually hiding like one if they're in pain they'll go into the closet or under the bed like or under drawers and wow you know really? yeah so you just okay. kind of have to listen mm. yeah that makes sense but it's, it's so weird to think that something that's happening outside the house can affect my cat i don't think people would ever consider that 
Yeah. Right? Yeah, they don't. Wow. Even if you're just moving from one house to another, that could That's cause... That's really stressful for them. Really stressful. Yeah, so the people from yesterday with the block cat, I was asking if anything changed. Uh, they brought a grooming service to give a bath to the cat a week ago. That was the only thing that was different, and the cat just got really stressed out from it. One grooming service. One grooming... But it has nothing to do with the grooming service. It's just that cat was getting groomed in a mobile service, and it just... It stressed it out. That was it. Sake. Yeah. Wow, because yeah. cause when I take them to the vet, I'm taking them tomorrow morning to get fixed. And on the way to the vet, they're, they're really They're panicking, like, yeah. It's like they're meowing all the way there yeah, for like it's an okay. hour. It's fine, though. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. And is it okay for males to meow even after they're fixed? Because they meow a lot right now. They're just talking of cats. Yeah? Yeah. So it's just a it has, personality yeah, it's thing. It's a personality thing. Nice. I have, one of my cats makes like bird sounds and stuff. It's fine. What? <laughs> Yep. <laughs> All right, that explains Mowgli because he meows in a weird way sometimes. Yeah, does he do that thing where he like moves his jaw really weird or like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There's probably a bird or something outside that he's looking at. That's crazy. Yeah. That's, and sometimes he meows without meowing, like, meow. Yeah. Meow. The, yeah. Is that cool? Is that yeah, okay? It's fine. It's fine. Huh? Yep, it's weird. It's okay. I'm just a worried parent. It's fine. <laughs> So how's Kuwait in terms of animals, Tamara? Oh, God. <laughs> yes, come on. Like, give us some you juice, really like... wanted to open the subject. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Seriously. Um, it's getting better. Nice. Yeah, it's really, really getting better. Um, we, I remember like, growing up, like I think our house was one of the only places that had dogs. So we'd get people like... I used to live in Salwa. So the Awazim used to like drop dogs off in my like front <laughs> front area. Like, all the time I'd wake up in the morning and there'd be a new dog. Okay. Um, but other really honestly, it's getting so much better. And with the rise of social social media, we're finding people who uh, they're doing a lot more work in terms of helping, rescuing, whatever. But we're also finding the people who are abusing them. Right, abusing Binding. where like right, where like before we wouldn't notice that animals were being abused as much. Like everyone's like, Oh, there's so much abuse in Kuwait. It's always been there. It's because we have a lack of education. But it's always been there. It's now with social media and the rescues posting about it. Like, why was there a dog shot in the head with an arrow? Why? Yeah. And now he's a very happy home in in the US. He was, survived. Yep, Karakoi got him. <laughs> Karakoi got him, he's got him to fighter. Royal. Yeah. I think it was uh, Royal or IVH. But basically, like, these people really, like, they're working. Um, there is a dog just now that Care Kuwait has. It was at Royal. I, um, I saw Maha, the one who, she runs Care Kuwait. I saw her yesterday. The puppy was smashed in the head. So part of its skull is broken in the front. You know, it's just like, <sighs> Okay, why? so have you, I'm sure you guys, did you guys talk to the guy who shot the dog with a bone? You can't find them. Okay, so have you spoken to people that abuse animals? And Yeah, so there was a guy posting videos of himself going around and shooting dogs in Chebd. This was about a year ago, year and a half ago. Uh, and we tried to get him. Like, he was posting videos and he said exactly where he lived. And, like, the people knew. He said his name. Like, he didn't care. And he was doing it to? Stray dogs. So if it's a stray dog in Kuwait, mafijat. Basically, they don't do anything. If it's an own dog, they can do something. But the Which government, means he has the right to go around and shoot straight dogs. Basically. Wow, and get away with it. Right. So the Baladia did nothing about it. They actually like laughed when we brought it up. Um, so it's like a, it's coming like the power does come from the people in this case because no one's really helping. When it, like the, no government entities are helping with the abuse of animals in the country. There is a law, but it hasn't been passed. Or it hasn't been enforced. One of the two. Anyway, it's just not in effect. Regardless of if it isn't passed or enforced, we don't have law enforcement going around confiscating animals that are being abused or neglected. We don't have proper implementation of systems that are going to protect animal rights. Uh, why are places still poisoning animals? Like, why is this still being sold? This should have been. This was supposed to stop like Wait, over a year ago. What are you talking about? Rat poison. Okay. Yeah. So you can, if you have a mezra'a and you're terrified of the stray dogs. You go and you buy poison and you put it... They use rat poison they for use dogs. Rat poison. Yeah. I thought you were talking about changing the rat poison for the rats, but... No, they no. use it for dogs. And it's a really slow, painful death. It's like... Oh. Yeah, it's about a 24 to 48 hour death. And they bleed wow. out into their abdominal cavities and they start having seizures and they're vomiting. They have diarrhea and they're oh just bleeding God. everywhere. Yeah. But I don't think the people who do that know that. No, right? they just think they, they just die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And do you think it's the 
education part, obviously, right? And yeah. do you think, is it different around the world? I mean, there are people that abuse animals in everywhere. the States. Everywhere. It's everywhere. 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 So where do you think um, change should start since social media is helping? In schools. Yeah. France has implemented a system where they actually teach you about animal care. And there's a center in Kuwait. It's, a, it's, a, it's called Regio Center. It's, for, it's a school for younger kids, like elementary, nursery, school. And their, their method of teaching is completely different. Um, they basically teach you... Uh, so they, they're implementing an animal care thing so that you know that this is how you touch the animal this is how you care for the animal like stuff like that and it's in coordination with the zoo one of the girls uh, in the zoo in the animal care group she her child goes to that school and so there she's helping bridge that gap so they're taking like goats and cats and like guinea pigs and so and rabbits so, like you can touch them and understand like this is how you care for an animal mm-hmm. you don't hit it you don't pull its tail you don't beat it stuff like that our problem is that we have a fear-based society in general, mm-hmm. right? If you do this, you get uh, a gold star. If you do this, you get hasanat. If you do this, you get, um, you, you'll be whatever. Recognition, whatever. Yeah, recognition. And on the other side, you have this place that basically says, if you, uh, if you do, if you don't do this, or if you do this wrong act, you go to. Uh, jail, hell, whatever. Okay, um, so black or white, basically. <clears throat> basically, but it, it never. It, it's just rules. Mm-hmm. It's never like what is the the pathos or the ethos or about it. You know, like what what are your why are you doing these actions? Mm-hmm. So they're never teaching you exactly. Like I hear this a lot. Don't touch the dog. It's dirty. Haram. Mm-hmm. Where? No. Yeah, that that yeah, came yeah, from nowhere, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? No, like, the yeah. only thing that came out from saliva and the only reason that it's they, they were worried, and it's not even haram, by the way, or makruh, none of that was there. The only reason that the saliva was questionable back in the day is because of rabies. So they realized that because of the frothing at the mouth, that these animals would get sick. And if you got bit, you were also going to get sick, mm. right? Because of rabies. Rabies is now controlled. Uh... I've seen the inside of a dog's mouth and a cat's mouth. Um, they're both equally gross. And I'm pretty sure dentists will tell you a human's mouth is just as disgusting. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, I like that you said that. That makes sense. That really makes sense. What else are some of the misconceptions that people have about animals usually? Based on uh, fear, that they're like property. That they're not like living beings. You know, like some, some guy messaged me the other day. He's like, فكرت uh, mm-hmm. بالمزرعة. I had a child in the Mazra. Yeah, yeah. I had a child in the Mazra. Yeah, basically. Yeah, exactly. And I had to explain. I'm like, you know, this has a spirit, it has a soul, it has feelings. And people don't understand that animals have feelings. Like, they don't understand that reptiles feel pain. They don't. So, you see an animal and you're scared of it, your first instinct is to throw something at it or squish it, right? Even cockroaches. Uh, and I had to get over my fear of cockroaches. But so really? I, yeah. It was. Uh, <laughs> do you want me to tell you something? Yes. <laughs> okay. Please. Uh, I was in Thailand working with um, at the Elephant Nature Park, the sanctuary in Chiang Mai, 2016. And I've, I'm, I haven't really ever had fear of any animal before, but mm-hmm. anytime I see a cockroach, my skin crawls, everything crawls. And I'm like, Ugh, it's this like <laughs> feeling. Um, and so it's trying my, I mean, you're sitting in a room and the whole thing is open from the top. There's a net for a reason, whatever. <laughs> and I'm on the phone and all of a sudden I was like, cause we were done for the day and I was talking to a friend and I was like, I'm gonna have to call you back. And I shut the phone cause I see this massive cockroach just like climbing on the wall. Pick up my slitter, slipper, and just poof, gone. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I was like, oh, done. Whatever. Went on with my day. Next day, I'm talking to the vets, and they're Buddhists. And in Buddhism, your soul and another living being's soul are the same, right? So you're yeah. not supposed to kill anything. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, yeah, I saw this cockroach, blah, blah, blah. I killed it. And they're like, you killed it? And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> what did I do? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh. You know, and it was this like feeling yeah. of, I was like, but they're kind of right. You know, they're, they're right. Actually, it's not even kind of right, but like, 
everything's kind of here for a reason. We've only messed up the ecosystem so badly that like things are in excess and in depletion <laughs> or extinction. So I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> so the universe sent me two cockroaches that day. Uh, I opened two. up two. I opened up this bag that I had like my shampoo and conditioner in. And they were chilling on top with like the antennas just kind of like oh going for it. And um, <clears throat> so <laughs> I kind of like shut the, the shut the bag and I was like, <sighs> okay, okay. And I was like, okay, breathe. Okay. Mm. I went out to the balcony, took the bag out, flipped it upside down and just dumped everything, everything. out. Everything. <laughs> I dumped it with the bag. I just dumped it. <laughs> and then I went down and like picked up the, picked up my shampoo and like the toll wiped it. And uh, that's how I got over it. And now, like, if I see a cockroach... Wait, you got over it like that? The fear, yep. I just realized I'm, like, I'm not better than them. Like, I'm really, I'm really not, you know? Like, I'm nothing. So, like, it's, I got to this, like, point of now I see cockroaches, especially working in the zoo or working outside or working, like, out. Like, I love to be in the field, yeah? So, like, I see bugs all the time. And I've always loved beetles. I think beetles are the cutest. But... Cockroaches, like I'll see them, and, I, and unless they're if they're coming at me, I mean I'm running away for sure, but I won't go out of my way to squish it. Plus, they carry their eggs on their back, so when you kill it, oh, you're killing a family. No, they release the eggs. <laughs> oh, that's even worse. That's like a survival <laughs> yeah, mechanism. They, Genius. And they release a smell, right? So they then all of a sudden they oh have like their God. friends come. Oh my God, that's why two other ones came. They, yeah, probably. Probably. But their friends came. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, oh, <laughs> maybe there's well, That's food. an amazing tip, huh? Yeah. Do not kill a couple. Don't kill them. Just Befriend like, them. I don't know. Put them in a in a Tupperware and take it outside <laughs> or something. I don't know. It's tricky. I was thinking about why I, because I know when it comes to brassies, I kind of freak out. But I was realizing, I was trying to understand why the hell am I afraid of these animals, certain animals, you know? I came to realize that it's because maybe the uncertainty of not knowing. Because I know physically, I know this animal is not capable of doing anything. You're, you're scared. But you don't know where the hell the animal <laughs> yeah. is going to go next. If I know that it's in a cage, I can stare at it for hours. But do you but want you, it in a you cage? Don't know. No. Yeah. But I think it's the uncertainty. Yeah. Do you think it's... it's Where does the fear come from? Because you could be afraid of any cockroaches and not afraid of lions or tigers. Or, yeah. So where do you think it comes from? Um... I think we're really taught that these animals are gross. Mm. I don't know. I feel like we're always taught like, for me, it's that that people. I don't know when you're small, they talk about like creepy crawly things. I don't know. I don't know why the cockroach and not the beetle though. Like beetles, I you pick them up, okay, be home and like spiders, exactly, yeah. okay, be home. For some reason, cockroaches no. I think because people are like, oh, gross! It comes from the balua, you know. So it's like, yeah. wait, what? You know, you <laughs> where were it, you? <laughs> so do you think it's beliefs? Huh? I don't. Yeah, I just think it's just you, conditioning. You don't think it's natural. Like some people are naturally afraid of certain things. There is a belief that a lot of your past lives, uh, if you believe in this, your past lives, you can bring in your experiences, right? Yeah. So a friend of mine. Uh, she used to be scared of dogs and she wrote about this and then she worked with like a healer to break it because there was no reason for her to ever be scared of dogs she had mm -hmm. no experience with dogs that should have told her she, to be scared she's never been attacked always never had but she'd see them and would start crying yep. um, and so a lot of people think it's your past life that you, something maybe you got attacked in a past life and you just carried on into this one and until you resolve it then you'll carry it on carry it on to the next one Yeah. so that that's a belief i don't know a lot of people have different types of beliefs yeah 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 i mean like yeah i see it as maybe information that's stored in your dna that's passed down sure you know, yeah like yeah. acquired traits are definitely passed down and acquired yeah. behaviors it's like uh, otters actually they already know how to break a shell with a rock they already know yep they already know it's passed on it's a gene that's actually passed on so uh like evol evolutionary physiology looks at that a lot in terms of like traits that are passed down through populations for survival mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know maybe your mom was also scared of lizards or your dad yeah 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 exactly that's what I think and it's somewhere down the line you gotta break it I have to I have you to face it خلاص, huh? break it break it break it break the Befriend cycle brassy, خلاص, that's my next goal what's it gonna do to you nothing you're right where is it gonna go nothing possibly so when you say teach kids how to treat animals do you think you're able to teach people empathy or it's natural? Because certain kids usually are naturally just inclined to go and be curious and pet that animal and vice versa. 
I think it's an interesting question because there are people who are wired differently. Like we're all wired pretty differently, right? And mm-hmm. I think empathy is a scale. So yeah. I don't think it's like you don't have it or you have it. I think it's there just in amounts and uh, towards different things. So some people are completely unempathetic towards people of a different race, mm-hmm. but they're great with animals. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so I think it's something <laughs> that could be taught. That's, because, that's like an amazing point. So. Yeah. So I think it, it really is something that can be taught. I think if you, uh, it's not a limited emotion. You know, it's not like you can only have it for this and you can't have it for this. Like you can, and it's not even about teaching empathy. It's teaching behavior when it comes to that, because you might not like animals Mm -hmm. at all, but to teach a child, okay, you don't like animals, but don't go out of your way to throw a brick at its head is it's not it's not about empathy it's just behavior it's conditioning that's like classical conditioning right like you see an animal you just teach people if you don't like it walk away that's pretty scary if you see a kid that wants to go and smash the animal's head i mean like what's going on through that kid's head or person's head like you said with or their the arrow, environment or their environment it's, it's tricky you know i mean like is the are those psychopathy any uh, tendencies yeah, yeah, can be, but yeah, for sure. And I think we have a really high percentage of it in Kuwait, to be honest. I mean, mm. people don't realize animal abuse and psychopathy have a very strong link. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing is, like, so we're just breeding a bunch of serial killers, I guess, uh, in some in some form. Um, when you look at suppressed societies, you start to see behaviors that have anger and violence and aggression, right? Because they're not able to use creativity properly or they're not taught to use creativity creativity prop- properly and they're jaded so that need and want to give back or that need and want to uh grow it's it's at this like level of numbness right so they're just numb people who will see an animal and you like come on you see a puppy you're like <gasps> so cute you know or you see like baby i guess babies like I'm, i don't really get that response to a lot of babies but people see babies and they're like ovaries explode or whatever it is but imagine people who'd never have the stimulation where they always think I pre- reproduce because I'm taught to reproduce. I study because I'm taught to study. They're not enjoying it. No. They don't go out to the opera house. They're not experimenting in dance. They're not learning to read. They're not learning to draw, to paint. So I don't think that they see an animal and first it doesn't look like them. Right. Mm-hmm. And then they're seeing it and it acts differently than them. So mm-hmm. for them, it's below them. It's never this feeling of, like, let me nurture you, which is what people should, I feel like, maybe sometimes have with animals. Like, when I see one, I'm like, oh, I want to take care of you. It's never like, like even a tiger, like, I want to take care of you. It's never like, oh, my God, I'm terrified. No. Mm -hmm. So I think once, if we have more stimulation in a country where we are more more exposed to the arts, to music, to dance, uh, to to things that kind of light your fire, then I think we'll start to see empathy a little bit more across the board uh, in terms of like whether it's an animal, empathy towards an animal, to a person not from our culture. Um, And I mean, it's the same way like people will come to the zoo with their uh, their helpers and they'll say like, why should I pay for her? It's a helper, which means Mm -hmm. that you're negating that person as a living, breathing entity Mm -hmm. like they don't realize that that's their actual thought process is so what you know when you hear these stories about people who are uh, working in houses they're the only person working in a house and taking care of 10 kids and sleeping in a mattress in the in the stairwell you know it's like what kind of environment are did you come from and what environment like for the people who are doing this and what environment are you teaching your kids why are you teaching your kids it's okay to pull a dog's tail and swing it around or burn a cat or uh, cut Treat off its person tail. like this well about even the way you see them cheating housekeepers in a way where it's exactly so yeah yeah there is a genetic component component i'm sure but it's also just a general malaise and they're just they're bored people are bored here it's like they don't they're either really bored or really narcissistic where they only care about themselves but i see kids like Hello, we're doing a good job like in our area in Aguila in our block we have so many people with dogs so everyone's always educating kids but we have these kids like 
I remember when we first moved there, they didn't know how to interact with a dog. They'd bark at it and scream and throw things. And I'd be like, hey, no, you can't do that. Or like, they um, bark at a dog. Yeah, they always it. bark I at a dog. I, I always it. bark at a dog. I'm like, what? Is that? Okay, you know, but it's fine, you know, yeah. and you just have to teach. Just, hey, you know, it's, my dog's great, so I just ought to sit. She'll sit. Uh, they'll come over, you know, at first they'll do this like touch thing and run or like screaming. And then now they're like, can we walk with you? So it's taken years. But it's like, if you just take the time to educate other people's children <laughs> and yes, your own, yes. then that's a completely different, yes. like, it can, it can work, mm. you know? Yeah, so it's not basically the kid's fault, right? It's, it's, yeah, they, it's not their fault until a certain age. Because okay. then you are... Responsible. Whereas you're responsible, yeah. you have to hold yourself accountable of at course, a certain point. Of course, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it does. I mean, and you mentioned how... And the dance and music are all connected to um, just expressing yourself and how important it is and how that relates to how you treat not just animals but everyone around you. Can you just talk more about that? Yeah, um, I think we're uh, we're kind of dual in nature. Yeah, we're a body and a spirit, and I and I guess consciousness kind of falls into the spirit category at the mm-hmm. same time. Or if you want to think we're three in one, we can be. Um, you know, I, I just started to get into meditation, which is really hard for me because I'm a mover. So mm-hmm. like being that stillness is super hard. But my dad is like an expert meditator. And he's, really? he's amazing. He's always meditating. And my mom does a lot of yoga. But like... Talk about um, the environment. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> like, I've never heard anyone tell me that. My dad is an amazing meditator. Yeah, he meditates every morning and every night. And you know, like for him, meditation may be different from the way you do it or I do it. But... Um, I think through dance and aerial, I've, okay, so I had a, growing up, I had a really bad eating disorder, and I went into a treatment program for it in 2009, because I was dying, basically. Wow. Um, I had no memory, I couldn't, I was like tiny, I was what would like, people want to look like, you know, this like super frail, tiny, but like, still looked like I had muscle, I was still working out, but too much, you know? Um, and I, ha- I was starting to lose my memory. Like, I couldn't remember anything. And, like, my best asset is my brain. Like, that's it. I love right? that, yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, two very good friends actually put me into treatment. And I went into an inpatient program for eight days. And then an outpatient program for five weeks. What does inpatient program mean? Uh, basically, you're in a facility, in a treatment facility. And you're for pre- eight days. For eight days. And you're, like, confined to a chair, basically. And you have to log everything, like... You eat a meal, and then they give you a certain amount of time you can eat it. Whatever you don't finish, like, you get privileges and not, or, like, they make you, like, journal about it. There was a lot of coloring involved. Like, I don't know why, but, like, everyone all of a sudden is going back into this mode where you're just coloring. Yeah. Learn how to meditate. Did a little bit of Tai Chi. Like Here in Kuwait? No, this was in the States. <laughs> it's like, Tai Chi? No, definitely not here. Um, <laughs> but... Though I think it is actually getting more awareness. Uh, there is a woman who does drama therapy with people with eating disorders. She's amazing. I'll give you her contact. Yes. Uh, yeah. And so I've always, but I was a dancer. And then it's funny because I went through this break where um, I started to use dance to connect with myself. So I learned how, when I started doing aerial, aerial was to get fit, but I don't like to call it fitness. It's art. Right, so for me, the fitness part is just I have to do it because I want to do things on the silks, or I have to get fit to do handstands. It's not let me lose weight. It's never that, right? So that's why I like aerial because I learned how to connect with or circus arts. I connected with my body through movement. <clears throat> Sorry, with dance, I learned more this year in the last year uh, through modern dance about myself than I have doing anything else. So wow. Um, I work, I take class with Jumana Rafai. She's incredible. I've learned how to move parts of my body that I didn't realize I could move. <laughs> but I've also learned how to let go a little bit of control and not to do too much. But I used to always think like, oh, I need to do this because it will look good. Or if I do this, it won't look good. You know, and it's not a re- like she's like teaching me like it's not about that. It's about how you feel. Don't think. And for me, like when someone says don't think, I'm like, what do you mean? You know? <laughs> Uh, I did a workshop with a woman called Galen Hooks. And remember we were talking about looking at yourself? Mm -hmm. The first thing she made all of us do was stand directly in front of a mirror and stare at ourselves and every eighth count take a step back. And it was probably the hardest thing I've had to do in years. 
and just to stare at yourself and take one step back every eight count one step back every eight count I couldn't connect and she like I remember she's like so sorry what's your name again and we were like eight we were 12 girls and uh, I was like Tamara and she's like shifty eyes and I was like shifty eyes shifty eyes I couldn't stare at myself in the mirror I couldn't look and connect because I'd look and then I don't know I'd be like no like I, it's too much like it's either it was either like a confidence thing or I just wasn't connecting with myself and like there are times that I am at war with my body for sure like I just feel disconnected from it but dance has actually put me an aerial and circus that's how I connect with my body because I have to move with my breath I have to move with my mentality I am able to actually sometimes quiet my mind but it's all about connecting my body with it so and it's about learning how to not it's like not thinking about how you look right but how you feel so if I do a movement and I'm moving with intention which is something I learned how to do this year which was she was like if you are looking at your audience and you're dancing that's why she made us stare at ourselves in the mirror you're moving with intention everything because naturally if you're looking down your head goes down your body posture slouches the way you carry yourself will reflect your mood so she's like look up look down only when you need to look down but not all the time and i feel also when i work out sometimes i look down even though if, especially if there's a mirror oh my god wow uh, yeah <clears throat> so it's like small things that i learned about myself and my confidence and my self-esteem through dance that is beautiful it's <coughs> fun <laughs> it's beautiful it's beautiful because any learning how to move with your breath learning what your body can do and what it can't do yeah and it's legit something that you discover like i discovered what my body can do when i went hiking one for the first time i'm like damn my body can't talk that way you can do this yeah, that's it's, awesome it's crazy you know yeah. i discovered my body can't hike <laughs> <laughs> please you discovered your body can circus and dance yeah. so when you say circus people might think of the circus so what do you mean when you say circus like, arts yeah okay um so uh, I know you've interviewed Muna before, and you just interviewed him. Uh, Muna's my aerial partner, yeah. right? So we work a lot together when we can. She she's tried to amazing, get me into, Allah. yeah, she's so strong. This woman is <laughs> so strong. Like, yeah, I aspire to have that level of like conditioning. She's yeah. and she's so disciplined. Um, but um, aerial, I guess, like any aerial is anything that's lifted up in the air so you've mm -hmm. got silks lira rope um there's something called wheel of death wheel of death yep it sounds it's exactly what it sounds like it's two wheels that are like connected to each other and they spin together and there is people in the wheels and the wheels are spinning at the same time and they're inside and they're outside on top of the wheels doing acrobatics whoa yeah it's crazy you should look it up whoa <laughs> it's wait, wait, so, so cool. it's like two hoops and a bigger hoop or what no no like the wheel is something you can stand in it looks like a german wheel which is like you stand in it so basically you're full on it okay and it's there's more space for you so when you're in it you can like run in it and it's moving but it's also moving on an axis with something else okay it's so cool i just found the video of this recently because uh because it's I met somebody who knows how to do it. I was like, what? And I looked it up and I was like, this is insane. Like, they're in it running and then they're all of a sudden, they're like hand standing on it and standing, hand standing on top of it. And the whole thing is freaking moving. It's how crazy. Thick, how thick is that thing? Like, is it a it's wheel? Big. wheel? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a wheel. It's like a, uh, it's, it's, it's like a hamster wheel, but for people. Really? Yeah, but it's made out of like, obviously like aluminum yeah, or something yeah, yeah. strong yeah because i saw something i don't know if it was you muna or somebody else the big playing. wheel yeah that's me yeah that's a sear wheel it's called rue sear um it's a it's floor apparatus so there's so there's different types of apparatuses in the circus you've got the air stuff which is all the aerial mm -hmm. flying trapeze sta static trapeze lira um there's got floor, the floor huh? floors like contortion hand balancing tumbling uh and uh, Seer, Rue Seer, and uh, sorry, German Wheel uh, dance can also be considered acrobatics depending on what you're doing. Um, but uh, yeah, the Seer Wheel is really hard. <laughs> yeah. And I love it. Yeah, I really love it. Feels like you're walking to Ubis at the same time. You're but spinning in it. You have to spin or you fall. Yeah, or you can go side, like cartwheel it. Like I learned how to cartwheel. Uh, it's That's hard. So cool. Yeah. I don't know, but it looks. So much fun. It is. <laughs> oh, like if you're really good at that, you can go crazy. Yeah, there are like really amazing artists. Like I follow them on Instagram. And honestly, like 
watching the things they do, they've used it basically as an extension of themselves. Mm. It's really nice. And it looks like they're dancing with it. I like the words you use as oh, an thanks. extension of yourself. <laughs> and well, such, and you how you say and, and how how you describe dancing as it's a learning process. You know, like, because I kind of experienced that with yoga. Like, when you're in a certain pose, certain emotions come out, or when you're in a, yeah, and you realize that your body doesn't like this pose, so they make you stay in there longer just so you can, you know? Yeah. So you start learning things about confidence. All of these things show up, you know? So, um, what else do you enjoy doing other than dancing, treating animals, uh. <laughs> safe animals? <clears throat> what made you want to start, for example, meditating? Um, my mind is chaotic and uh, I'm chaotic actually like if you see my room and sometimes my room is in my posts uh, <laughs> it's a disaster like my mom is a really big neat freak and my life is organized piles like yeah, yeah. my head is in terms of the way I think is very clear but my life my surrounding space is a disaster and sometimes like I think my thoughts just get too fast and they I have ideas constantly like I have constant ideas and I write them down and I never do them and I just I wanted meditation as a way to balance myself a little bit more and the anxiety that I have um, towards like stupid stuff in life like sometimes you know because like I talked about an eating disorder the thinking is kind of the last thing to go you know like that behavior is doing the routine I can do like obviously eat obviously don't go and purge obviously if i didn't eat today don't go running you know what i mean like stuff like that um the, the, the mentality aspect is i felt that i wasn't taking care of my mind in a way like i i can abuse myself sometimes or like tell myself i'm not good enough or uh that i'm not enough um or that I'm not smart enough or that I'm not pretty enough and we all have these thoughts and sometimes too old or too old or yeah, too yeah you're, you're too, too big, something too or you're not enough right mm. uh, and I think that when you start to exercise your mind in that way where you're you're teaching it that like you're disciplining it to quiet down or you're disciplining like you're not shaming yourself for your own thoughts uh, and not getting stuck in that loop that I'm hoping it's <laughs> much healthier outlet. So mm. then like sitting and just getting deeper and deeper into a cycle of like self-punishment or self-hate or whatever it is. Self-abuse. Self-abuse, yeah. Self-abuse. I mean, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's interesting realizing how many tomatoes are inside your head. Yeah, woo, there's a and lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Each one has a different yeah, the style, different way of speaking. You know, and I, I seriously start to realize this lately, especially any, any if you're if you're out there and active, you know, you're doing a lot of things. There's a lot of things happening in your mind and a lot of voices. And I realize that the only voice I should listen to is the one that I speak out loud with. So when you start talking to yourself out loud, realize that that dude or that girl or that person never says anything that doesn't align with your values. I'm not saying right or wrong, but notice yeah. when you're sitting in the car, just start talking out loud. So I started doing that for at least a minute every day. A minute is, is, is a long it's time. It's quite a long actually. time, yeah. actually. Yeah. So I just start talking to myself. Hey, so what do you need to do today? Ugh, I have to go and work out. Okay, why are you feeling not good about working out? Why don't you feel like working out? And then I just start entertaining that thought and reframing it. Because your mind, as soon as you say, tell it, you're going to go and see family today. You're going to go to the gym. You're going to have to read for an hour. And then you have a client, for example. If you give those things to your mind, your mind naturally, its job is to find things to protect you, right? It's not, the, it's, no, it's, it's, it's job is not to make you happy. So for that reason, it's going to protect you from all the negative possibilities that might happen in each of those situations. So it's going to anchor each one of those situations in a way that might not be pleasant for you to want to go and do, which is tricky, right? Why would yeah. I want to do that? For that reason, I kind of try to re-anchor everything I'm doing on a daily basis. Okay. So today I have two recordings for Dead Dish. I have to go to the gym and I have to see my family in between. Ah, 
that sounds a bit stressful. So if you start re-anchoring them by asking yourself, for example, why do you want to go to the gym? It's going to make me feel good. When I feel good, I'm going to perform better in life. I'm going to sleep better. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to maybe meet people over there that might be good candidates for dead dish. You know, so all of these things is reframing. It takes work because I used to do it literally like closing my eyes and choosing one, each one and re-anchoring it, you know. And in NLP, they teach you how to anchor things by repetition or breaking an anchor. Like, do you smell popcorn right now? You see I something? I smell nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't take her a second. So I was like, I smell nothing. <laughs> it's just so blocked that things happening up here. <laughs> so that's very interesting. What they do in NLP is that they try what to... Is, sorry, what is NLP? NLP is Neuro Linguistic Programming. Okay. So they okay. reprogram your neural pathways using language. Because we all, our brain speaks in primarily three languages, auditory, visually, and kinesthetic. So auditory is when you say, I hear what you're saying, for example. Or when you say, I see what you're saying is visual. Or when you say, I feel it. So these are just genetic. So if you go about, so basically if you meet somebody, a hypnotist, for example, the hypnosis started as soon as he, he or she shaked your hands. So they start observing how you speak, your eyes, where they go, every time you're saying something, your body language, because all of these come into account. So that's what they do in NLP. And that's what I'm trying to incorporate in my life when it comes to like limiting beliefs and how I see myself. Because if, if you realize that everyone, everyone has insecurities. And I was talking to Intisar last week, and she was saying that if I told you that you're a pink hippopotamus, you laugh. And I, I laughed when she said that. But if I told you something that was true, you would get angry because it's true. If I told you that you don't look good or your body's like that, you would get angry. You won't laugh because it's true. So it's very tricky when somebody, especially in social media, that's why a lot of people get like cyberbullying or they just can't handle it is because of we're not used to getting these slaps on a daily basis in reality, right? Like when you're going through your day, nobody in the street is going to stop and go, Tamara, you're fat. Tamara, you don't look good. Tamara, like, okay, maybe once in a blue moon, but 50, 30, 20 a day can really damage a lot of people's psyches, you know? So yeah, I love the limiting belief part that you mentioned. And it's something that I think as soon as you realize that everybody has them, you know, like the most beautiful girl, quote unquote, beautiful girl that we see on social media, has insecurities thought 50 billion times before posting that be beautiful yeah. picture and chose one out of a hundred it's crazy because i work with people and i teach them how to build their confidence in front of the camera so i see what happens behind the camera i see what they go through and and, and, and the, the patterns you know what what causes us to be afraid of the camera although we're we're not afraid of speaking on stage, for example. You see certain people that they say, I can present to a thousand people, but when I hold the camera, I can't speak to them, you know, or vice versa, you know? So it's very tricky when you see fears, limiting beliefs, mm -hmm. how our brain works, and asking yourself, why does our brain focus on the things that are negative, you know? They're more memorable. <laughs> yes, they are. They're true. That's true. It's like when you touch fire and it burns you, your brain connects fire to pain. It's like when you're in a relationship and it burns you, your brain connects relationship to pain. It's like a survival ah. mechanism kind mm -hmm. of thing, right? Yep. Yeah, you see with these two babies too. <laughs> yeah, I love them. They're so cute, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, adorable. Chunky Monkey. They're adorable. <laughs> you know the funny part, Chunky Monkey? The funny part is that one. Guests come and they're like, oh, your cats are so nice. I'm like, Phew. it's like when you see, go to a, a family house and you see kids and like, your kids are adorable. And the parents look at you like, you don't even know. Yeah. As soon as you guys leave, they're, they're <laughs> like crazy. It's how it on. And <laughs> so what would you like to, um, this, this has been a fun episode, Salah. What would you like to share as a message to everyone here in Kuwait when it comes to animal cruelty or if they're thinking of purchasing or adopting an animal um okay if you're a kid person like if you like children think about you're bringing a new addition a new child into your household okay 
you're gonna have to treat it with the same respect, the same amount of time. You're gonna have to put, if it's sick, you're gonna have to take it to the vet. If it's tired, you're gonna have to let it sleep. You have to figure out, um, like each life stage has a different requirement for sleep, a different requirement for play. You're gonna have to teach or train the same way, I guess you train a child, you train children, mm -hmm. I guess. <laughs> I'm not sorry. Um, it, it's, it's a, you're bringing, you're going to be giving, if you're gonna purchase, purchase or adopt or whatever you're doing, you're going to be giving a, a soul a new place to be, right? You're, you're letting it occupy a space in your household, so you need to be able to cre give it space to grow. It's like a relationship. Mm -hmm. You need to give someone or something, someone or something, the space to grow if you really love it. The same thing with an animal. Um, if you're thinking about doing the whole illegal wildlife, a, like ex exotic thing, like please don't. <laughs> <laughs> just don't like stop buying tigers and lions because the way they're brought into the trade is is really heartbreaking uh it's it's not fun they're really traumatized a lot of the time it will eventually hurt you uh, a lot of our animals are confiscated animals or they're given up to us because they're realizing that um they can get aggressive a lot of people are leaving them in a house it's like these animals need to run uh, and if you really, if you're not interested in animals at all, instead of, you don't have to be. Like, you don't have to like them. You can be scared. If you'd like to work through that fear, that's that's awesome. I think that's great. But if you if you don't like them, just leave them alone. Like, don't go out of your way to hurt them. Don't go out of your way to, like, make their life harder than it already is, right? It's the same thing. Like, if I don't like you, which I do like you, don't worry. Uh, I wouldn't go out of my way to make your life a living hell. I just would avoid you, right? So but there are people that are like that. There and, are know, people that are like that. They invest their time and energy, yeah. you know. But then like the question is then what's wrong with you on the inside? Like, I guess you just have to sit and reflect like, why do you want to hurt this being? Or like, why don't you want to give it the same respect you would give a, another living being? Like, it's just a change of perspective. You just have to look at it like, a different it's a, it's a it's a spirit in your house or with you or around you so are you really the type of person that's going to go out of your way to hurt it that's it i love it so two questions one is about how can you buy a tiger from instagram <laughs> and it's that's, quite easy that's pretty crazy and i think that changed a little bit in the past couple of years well i realized that they're yeah they're reduced. cracking down they're cracking down yeah and what happens to these animals yeah and he, so many monkeys, chimps, lions, white tigers, all every, any, what happens to them? They die. Really? Yeah, so a lot of the times the nutrition's off. Like a lot of people, I've realized a lot of people don't research. So they'll be like, oh, someone told me I should feed it this. And I'm like- Obviously, I mean, if they bought a lion, they did a research anything. <laughs> yeah, but they think it's really cool, right? They think like, uh, oh, I have this lion, I can, uh, pose with it for Instagram I can show it off to my friends it can live with me like a cat it's like no eventually it's going to probably hurt you um, working freehand with a wild animal is hard and what you're going to do is you're probably going to keep it in chains and then it's going to get more frustrated and it's going to just make the cycle worse cheetahs in Kuwait usually they die within a year and a half they that's get sick. the average and what's their lifespan in, in nature uh you can go up to like 1820 uh, a year in, in and captivity, a half in captivity in captivity in that's captivity. still that's still yeah i have to fact check that but mm. um i mean i know that tigers can go up to 25 27 28 years in, in captivity, captivity if they're taken really good care of so a year and a half like they get sick and their immunity because they need their immunity to be built in the wild from running they're also genetic their gen genetic diversity is really low because and so they're pretty much like endangered basically their gen genetic diversity is so low that if one thing hits them that could wipe out that like that they don't have immunity against that whole population can go so when you say genetic diversity you mean that different genes different uh sorry uh, uh cheetahs from different parts of the world or different regions breed together they're very similar they're all inbred that's why they're dying out yeah Wow. So I think their genetic diversity was less than 0.25% or something stupid like that. Um, like if you think about it, um, if you're looking at moths, 
Think about all of those species of moths and how genetically different everything is. Like during the Industrial Revolution in the UK, when uh, all the white moths, there used to be more white moths than dark moths, right? Because the buildings were white and the birds could find the dark ones and eat them. When the Industrial Revolution happened, because of the smog, the brown ones started to survive and the white ones would get eaten because the they, birds would yeah. see the white ones on the dark surface. Mm-hmm. So if you think about that, that's basically genetic diversity. If you think about it on a, on a cheetah scale, if all cheetahs contracted a disease, none of them would be able to survive. But if there was, because of mutations, right, things survive and pass their genes on. Mm-hmm. Their, their, gene- their mutation rate's so low that they probably won't. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And that's one of the main reasons why a lot of animals are... Oh, extinct or endangered or... Endangered and extinct or that's uh, a No, I reasons. think it's people. It's people and the... <laughs> people are the People? Yeah. And do you think it's because we're solving more diseases than we should? So when we solve most di- diseases that humans face, meaning we'll have more humans, meaning we'll um, have more than, way more than we needed because we're surviving way longer than we should... So if you do that with no. monkeys, we'll have way more monkeys in the world. Alan Watts mentioned that. Like I this. love Alan Watts. Yeah, like he said that. I was like, wow. So yeah, that kind of... Because he, he, yeah. he didn't take medicine. He's like, when my body decided to stop. It's, it's just... It's, yeah. He wants to stop. It's yeah. selfish. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very so is breeding. Uh, anyway, <laughs> just throw that out there. Um, I think, honestly, it's because... Well, we have a really great balance between uh, war and life. Uh, the problem is our resources I think in general we're destroying so many so many ecosystems in the world and I think that's what's really leading to the endangerment or extinction of species the fact that people can't control themselves and feel like they need to hunt a rhino also like by the way why like Mm. you know what I mean they're just uh, I don't think it's about only solving diseases like sure we are living longer Mm -hmm. but I think there's so much destruction that we're just doing to the planet and we're just destroying habitats like pandas and you know they're destroying all the bamboo forests and Amazon like you're thinking if you're destroying an Amazon like destroy one area think about how many different species live in just that one area and how many homes you're breaking like how many homes of uh, uh, even fungus like you go down to that level right the fungus that's living on the soil or the insects in the soil or on the trees that have houses or the, the birds that are burrowing like making little, their nests in the trees or animals burrowing into the dirt and the animals that are living on the trees wow. and the birds like do you know what I mean like you think you about it you just a picture of my idea yeah, like the scale that you yeah. you, do, you just knock down like maybe the size of your room and you're destroying so many houses so I think that's kind of where we're going in terms of extinction. It's all over the place, Ad, if you put it that way. And yeah, said, if you put it that way, if you just destroyed like 10 meters by 10 meters, you just destroyed a bunch of things that took them years for them to be able to have this harmony or dance or whatever yeah. you want to call But don't you think that it is part of our nature to be, quote unquote, bad? Destructive? Destructive. Because we're a part of Earth, right? It's like we're not... And uh, we can't separate the apple from the tree, in my opinion, I think. And it's just like we are. I think uh, we've evolved to disconnect from nature. So I think that we aren't working in harmony. I don't think it's necessarily like a good or bad uh, debate. I think it's we are realizing that with the increase in luxury and commodity that we can have a more comfortable lifestyle. Yeah. So we're more likely to think only about our, our own luxuries instead of like what the benefit for the world or a greater population would be. Does mm, that make sense? Mm, yeah, we're naturally selfish, I think. Yeah. I don't know if it's naturally selfish. Uh, I think we have a tribe mentality. Like, especially, I think it's different. Like the U.S. is a very individualistic society. We are more family, tribal based. Um, I think at the I think we're just getting lazy. <laughs> I think we're just lazy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think especially here, like I think and you can see the laziness everywhere. Like people who just feel like they're entitled to have something without working for it. Like that's laziness, right? The fact that 
we don't leave our house to go get food anymore is laziness. The fact that we can get items delivered to our house is laziness. Yes, it's creating jobs, I understand. But at the same time, like, I think it's so much work to create a safe space and, and build, like, for example, like, we have all of these things being broken down in Kuwait, uh, like buildings and whatever, for malls. Instead of like, let's build a garden where like people can come, like a community garden. Why has nobody thought about this? Like, money, why is money, 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 money? money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is very true. I mean, a friend of mine, Phoebe Salam. I don't know if you yeah, know yeah. Yep. she's a very, and she's really active when it comes to yeah, any, the environment in Kuwait and how streets should be, and the way people should be able to walk in Kuwait City instead of. Oh any, my God. <laughs> I, I am so overdriving. I just want a metro, to be honest. I want a metro, yeah. a bicycle, and to walk. But it's like not possible with our infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. It's it's scary driving here in Kuwait. Honestly, yeah, it really is. It is. It is. And I've, I've I'd love to have a metro. Well, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, but things easier for you to be able to commute in Kuwait. Yeah, I but the thing is, mine, like, yeah. they they did the community garden, secret garden. Yeah, people went in and destroyed it. Like you, <laughs> and it was so small. It was so small. Like, are you kidding? Like, these are people who are able to come and build and and grow and develop a community by working together. You know, it's like a great way to to make friends is when you work with somebody, right? Uh, like Burning Man, that's kind of the whole idea. You're there, you're building together, you're creating a community. That's why people go out to the middle of the desert, you know, to do these things because we're so disconnected. We're all just kind of, even though we are a tribal in terms of our private life our work work life is really individualistic you have to work with a team but there's always this competition within the team i don't know i don't know mm. if i'm going anywhere with this but mm. <laughs> uh, it makes sense because i was thinking about the secret garden and it wasn't harming anyone or anything it's tiny not even a lot of people knew about it and mimi was doing great but yeah. still it's those people that want to invest their time energy and effort into making other people's lives hard but why <laughs> hopefully we'll get them once on Derdish and we'll ask them that yeah that would be great <laughs> yeah. Tamara wallah, it was really really fun talking to you Sarah. No, you too thanks wallah. for having me on here no seriously wallah, this episode was so much fun I hope each and every one of you guys listen to this episode <laughs> I think it's very important wallah, we covered a bunch of things in terms of self love health in general uh, moving your body that's part of health animals nature it was beautiful. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Amara. Thank you. And on that note, <laughs> take care, guys, and stay awesome. It's got to be against the law to look this damn good. Because, baby, I feel real good, and I wish I would. It's got to be against the law to look this damn good. Everybody watch out, watch out now I'm ready for a good time, and I came to groove The whole band's here and we came to move Got a fresh haircut and two new shoes We're here all night like we got nothing to lose I'm coming out the jacket cause we're turning up the heat I wanna see you clapping when you get up out your seat It's time to make it happen when we hit these streets I'm coming in hot and I can't be beat Watch out now Baby, watch out now Watch out I'm on the move, I'm going up I'm a man on a mission with no misses And I'm looking for love Oh, I'm just looking for love It's gotta be against the law to look this damn good Watch out now Cause baby, I feel real good And I wish I would Watch out now it's gotta be against the law to look this damn good, baby. Watch out now. Everybody watch out. Last call for the monster hall. And don't forget to tip. The sun went down, but we still relate. The band's still going, playing all ahead. I guess I'm now too legit to quit. I'm coming out the jacket, cause we're turning up the heat. I wanna see you clapping when you get up out your seat. It's time to make it happen when we hit these streets. I'm coming in hot and I can't be beat. Watch out now. Watch out. Watch out.
And baby, I feel real good And I wish I would I'll try now. It's gotta be against the law Look this damn good, baby I'll try now. Everybody watch out Watch out now Everybody watch out Watch out now Watch out 